JJ, the CPA here. Hope you're doing well. So we are coming down to days before the end of the year. And with that, we are running out of time if we want to make any difference to our or our client's tax picture. And so we're going to walk through a number of things as well as a few things related to W-2, 1099s. Of course, today is our seminar sponsored by ADP. That is why it's coming to you today for free. So we appreciate ADP doing that. And uh, we are going to walk through some things that uh, if you had ADP or your team was using ADP, you probably wouldn't even have to worry about. Now, if you're here, you know who I am, Joshua Jensen, CPA, been practicing for 31 years, coming to you from out of Oklahoma, 26 years I've had my own practice, traveling around the country, talking to fellow CPAs and EAs. Of course, you probably know I've got a channel on YouTube today is informational purposes only. It's meant to add to the commentary with your client or for you to take to your advisor. Uh, the one thing that we're thinking through here right now is year end, but I already have a seminar set for us on Tuesday, January 30th. It'll be at 1230. So with that, you can sign up for it uh, right now. And then, of course, with my uh, with my uh, association, my partnership with ADP, uh, you're going to get special treatment. You're going to work directly with the team, discounts, things for free. And right now, in studio, come on over, because we are doing some hard work. I'm going to put <laughs> on my, my, my hat. I've got my ADP hard hat on, but we have with us uh, Erica from Indiana. So we are working on some big projects right now, some engagements that we're keeping secret. secret. They're big time, and they're <laughs> fun, and we look forward to sharing more about that in January. So... You're here in Oklahoma. I am. And how are you enjoying it? I absolutely love it. Yes. And so you're hanging out with Coop and Alona yeah. and walking through some stuff, doing some stuff for year end. Mm -hmm. Now, is Haley on with us or is she, is she tied up? Would you know? I think she's still on that meeting. Okay. All right. So with that, uh, we're excited and I would lift it up, but I you don't want me know. To lift it up? I don't know that we can, but can uh, lift it? <laughs> of course, as we know that we have fun with uh, America's CPA, but uh, Erica made this Captain America <laughs> shield. It's made out of Legos, and uh, you transported that on the plane. Yes. Did have to touch it up some, but yeah. anyways, very <laughs> generous. So this right here will now be a new fixture in my background. So anyways, I know you're going to set it down very carefully. So Erica has helped me put together some information that we're going to be sharing with you on some of the deadlines and there are some new deadlines uh related to the w-2s so i'm going to jump into that anything else to say to the group before we head out no i kind of feel like out? i'm in person right now I know. everyone it's i love different it. and fun yeah uh, one of the things i was going to ask is so if you uh go to my website you're able to contact directly erica or Haley on the team but if somebody reaches out to you uh, you know, related to payroll mm -hmm. and whatnot. Uh, for those that haven't yet, mm -hmm. tell them what you would be able to visit with them about in terms of, okay, well, Erica's on the team. She's there. What could she help with? Yeah. Um, well, with the small businesses, or if you're um, a tax professional and you're wanting to talk about your clients, we really just do a free consultation, everything that you're doing now, stuff that you want to add in the future. Um, so we'll work with you on that. And I mean, really just help your clients in any way that we can. We are a really large company, but um, you work directly with Haley and I, and that's, you know, really the only people that you'll talk to here at ADP. So the free consultation, I think is the biggest thing. Um, and then if they have any tax problems or if they are wanting different benefits, we're able to like walk them through that process as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, last night at dinner with Cooper and Amanda, we were talking about one of the things you love about working at ADP is that you're not somebody that's there just to sell payroll. You're a consultant, yes. a small business consultant. And yes. working with Erica and Haley and the rest of the team, you know, Kelly and TJ and Lori and Alex and all the rest, um, that really does seem to be the case. You know, this is going to sound really weird, <laughs> um, but I think ADP 
They don't need your business, meaning they have plenty of business. They're making money. What they want to do is help small businesses. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, I, when I first started my practice, I would tell people that I would say, listen, I don't need to bring you on as a client, Yeah. right? I'm already making payment on my vehicle. I got the life that I want to live. I don't need, but I want to work with you. And I think there's a big difference uh, yeah. between that. Yeah. Um, so real quick, I know that you've had a few clients that of, of uh, kind of around the nation that have mm -hmm. called, but one of them, no, two of them, they're a CPA, but they've decided to get out of payroll. And then we're going to get to the seminar, <laughs> but they've decided to get out of payroll, mm -hmm. right? They have a practice yeah. and they've decided, you know what? I want to have a few extra hours. I don't want to have to chase deadlines. So tell us a little bit about that process briefly. It, Somebody wants to get out. Honestly, is the quickest process ever. We uh, have you fill out a grid with all of your clients and the price that they pay yearly for their payroll and ADP comes back and gives you what they think your payroll is worth. And it typically, or typically comes in over what like your annual, yeah. what is it, annual payment or fee right. is. Um, so the process is really quick. And then Haley and I work with the CPAs on getting every single thing that we need. You have a full team, I think of five or six individuals who help you pull every document that you need and get the process started. But I mean, it's usually like a one or two week turnaround if you want to get out and get your checks really fast. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, and, and just to be clear in closing on that is, I don't think anybody else does that, but I've, I've got some people that I visited. So I was up in Indianapolis mm -hmm. visiting with the team up there and you helped me put together uh, a seminar for CPAs, EAs uh, and tax professionals. But one of the things is, especially as practices, maybe they're getting too full or maybe somebody's like, eh, look, I may want to retire in 10 years or so. If you wait until the very end to sell your whole practice, you know, what value are you going to get for your payroll services? And I, my thought is very really? little, right? Yeah. It's not very profitable. People yeah. don't really want to buy the payroll. They just yeah. buy, the, buy the clients yeah. and the books. Yeah. So. And Kelly, who's on the team, uh, the leader on the team has indicated that it's 5% profitability mm -hmm. on payroll services. Mm -hmm. But if you're selling your payroll services now, you didn't sell your client relationship. You're teaming up, you're partnering with yeah. ADP. So if somebody's billing on an annual basis, $100,000 gross to their clients, they're probably netting five grand, mm -hmm. maybe 10 grand. Maybe you're going to lie and say you're netting 20 grand <laughs> or you don't know what your number is. Yeah. But ADP is going to write you a check for a hundred grand. And I dare say actually a lot more than that, yeah. but it's at least that. And so anyways, you're changing lives. Yeah. Is really what it comes down to. Yeah. And I mean, like the CPA or tax professionals, clients, they stay their clients. We don't take your clients away from you. We just work with you specifically only on the payroll side. It's yeah. not like we're doing everything else. I yeah. couldn't tell you how to do someone's <laughs> books, yeah. right. but I know how to do someone's payroll. So it's really just the payroll that we're doing. We're not taking yeah. the clients. And honestly, we don't really, We, I mean, we don't talk to the clients about other stuff other than payroll without the CPA's permission because yeah. they're your clients. They're not our clients. Yeah. 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 Well stated. All right. So she's going to go back at it. All right. I don't know. Oh, you, with my you, clip. <laughs> okay. You have a ponytail on. All right. Thank you. All right. Everybody say goodbye to Erica. Bye. Thank you. Go have a good lunch. And uh, we're going to now get into some tax planning. Thank you for your time, Erica. Yeah. So with that, uh, let's jump in and talk about uh, our tax planning and our year end. I have already presented major due dates. I'm not going to necessarily go through each one of those. Fellow tax pros, one of the things that I'm telling my clients is I've got to have your financials or your bookkeeping done by the end of January. Now, fellow tax pros, you may be kind of chuckling right now and say, oh, I wish. See, those are the kind of clients that you need to go ahead and fire for those small businesses that are here. You really don't have any reason to not have your books tied down for 2023 by the end of January. We're also telling our clients that by the end of February, we've got to have all your individual tax documents. With this, here are some deadlines. Now, I want to just focus in briefly on 1099s and W-2s, and then I got some info related to you 
uh, related to this to give to you. And one of those, I think a lot of people are going to miss this one thing after we get through the deadline. So I'm glad that you're here and you probably should spread the word and make sure your clients are aware because I think it's going to bite some in the in the end here because this uh, due date is not even in the instructions, but the IRS has updated it, but apparently hasn't updated the instructions for it, but related to the due date. So by the end of January, here's the big takeaway for small business owners and fellow tax pros, you know this, whatever you're having to get to the recipient has got to get to the recipient on or before January 31st of 2024 related to 2023. Yes, there's two exceptions. I'm going to show you that on the next page. But what we're talking about here is the Form 1099 miscellaneous, which we're going to review what that is and who gets that. And also the Form 1099 NEC. So whoever's to receive those, you've got to get it to them by the end of January. Now, for 1099 NEC, non-employee compensated, that's also got to get filed with the IRS before January 31st. Now, a 1099 miscellaneous, you have a little more time, which we'll see here in a second. Now, for Form W-2s, the Form W-3, that's got to get uh, to the IRS uh, by the end of January. And if you have more than 10 forms, you've got to also get that to the IRS uh, uh, electronically. So with this, if you're like, well, there's a deadline for this and a deadline for that, great, awesome. I'm glad you're on top of it. What did I say at the beginning? Informational purposes only. If you meet some kind of rare exception, awesome. I'm glad you're aware of it. In general, here are the deadlines. Also, by the end of January, any forms, 941, the 940 state forms. But here's the deal fellow tax pros. And, uh, oh goodness, I'm going to, I'm going to grab my new book here real quick. If I can find a copy of it. Uh, maybe Amanda could come in here and find a copy of my new book. Uh, we've got a, a big box, but anyways, I, I've got a new book that comes out. It's fine if you don't want to buy it, but here's what I want you to know. Fellow tax pros, small business owners, if you're caught up in the deadlines related to payroll, I say, bless you that you're still trying to keep up with it. Um, and I feel your pain. But really what I want you to start looking at here is should you partner with somebody to take care of it? Small business owners. And you, if you all know me very long, you know that I say this no matter what. I've said it since the beginning of time. My grandfather says it. Small business owners, do you want to spend even 15 minutes on forms to save a little bit of money? Or could you make two or three new phone calls, bring in a new customer and make a hundred grand, make a thousand dollars. See, small business owners, we think, well, I could do that. That's easy. So do you cut your own hair, small business owners? Do you cut your own hair? Because you could go to Walgreens, you could go to Walmart, you could get some shears, you could get some buzz things, you could get some scissors and you could cut your own hair. You would save what, 15, $20, maybe a month, maybe every other week. Ladies, do you dye your own hair? Do you give yourself your own perm? Do you cut your own hair? I can't imagine you're going to say yes. If you do, awesome. But if you don't even cut your own hair, even though it would save you some money, then what in the world are you doing, doing things related to payroll? Why? In the sense of find the expert. So I don't care where you go, but go to somebody that's an expert. Nonetheless, we are going to talk through some of these deadlines. Now, for those that are filing a Form 1099, you've got to file a Form 1096. And if you're even like Johnny now, it's like, oh my gosh, what's a 1096? You've got to get with a tax professional, small business owners. You shouldn't be scurrying to figure out what a 1096 is and then watching 14 videos and how to figure that stuff out. Now, you can get software. It's cheap. Good. Good for you. You want to go get the software. You're going to waste time. You're going to argue. You're going to you're going to go figure out which software you need and how much it is. And then you're going to download it. And then you're going to realize you got to get the forms. And then there's red forms and there's black forms. And then you got to print them out. And then it didn't print right. And then you got to figure out how to mail it. And how much time did you waste? What are we in business for? Is it a charity? Is it so you can do more paperwork? Is it pretending that you're in business by doing tax work? Or are you here to make money? I'm assuming you're here to make money. Why do you prepare tax returns? Because I love it. Yes, that's my first answer. Why else? Because I want to help people. That'd be my second answer. But you know what? If I'm not getting paid, I wouldn't prepare returns. If I'm not making money, I'm not doing this, right? So with this, 
you need to get with a professional related to these 1099s. And the only reason I'm prefacing it is because I normally don't go through what we're getting ready to go through because I really am a firm believer that somebody should be using a tax professional to actually help with these matters. Now, the Form 1096 is a transmittal, which is a summary of the Form 1099s in which you're now filing with the IRS. So you're filing all the 1099s, the red copy, and you have to have a summary on it. That's that Form 1096. Now I'm gonna go back a slide because you are filing the Form 1096 related to Form 1099 NEC by January 31st. Now, any Form 1099 miscellaneous, you're filing that Form 1096 with the IRS by the end of February. If you're paper filing, here's a hint to what we're getting ready to talk about. Only if you have less than 10 forms, and it's not just less than 10 1099 forms. The IRS has really kind of stepped this up. Now, you've got till the end of March to file your 1096 on your 1099 miscellaneous if you're electronically filing, which most are going to have to do. Now, we have some other deadlines. Now, the only reason I'm showing you these deadlines is some of the year-end planning that we would think traditionally would be part of it. You do have time to actually act on some of these things. What would that be? Well, putting money in your IRA, self-employed retirement plan, your HSA, 529 plan. So I'm going to hint on these things, but it's not technically things you've got to get done before year end, but you would want to probably know what is it that you're going to do? So here it is. I'm glad that you listened to Erica and I visit for a little while. And then I want you to remember what was the four, no, is it, let's see, uh, yeah, what was the four letters to this seminar? F-R-E-E. -E. And what comes at the cost of F-R-E-E? -E? Uh, you're going to hear some stories, right? So with that, I appreciate you getting to hear but there are new electronic filing requirements for Form W-2s and Form 1099s. And with this, you ready for this? You need to count up the forms that you're filing. So the W-2, W-3, 940, the 1099s, and if collectively for 2023, as I'm interpreting this and as other tax professionals are interpreting this, you need to file electronically, meaning you cannot e-file. So if you have only three 1099s to send out, but you also have employees, you're sending out W-2s, you're sending out a W-3 to the IRS. You're now sending uh, into the IRS 941, the 940, the whole payroll series. Pretty easy to get to more than 10 forms for the year. Now, if you are thinking, well, no, I'm right at eight forms or I'm at nine forms or I'm not sure if it's really for that, JJ. Here's what I'm saying. Why are you messing with it, number one? Number one, okay? Number two, just electronically file. Don't try and find ways to argue with yourself or with your professionals on, I don't need to electronically file. Don't be a fool. And I'm just gonna say it that way. Don't be a fool and think you can paper file stuff. Who could paper file? Somebody that has no employees, doesn't do anything related to payroll, and has a 1096, and has a few 1099s that collectively would be less than 10 forms. Now, the question that comes in is, well, is it 10 returns? As in, is it a 1099? Is that considered a form? Or is it two 1099s on one page, is that a form? And this is where I go, are we kidding? Why are we wasting time even figuring out, is it one page or is one uh, page that have two 1099s on it? Does that equal two or is it equal one? With that being said, here's what we do with our clients. We electronically file it. I don't care if they've got one. I don't care if they've got five. I don't care if they've got 20. I don't care if they have employees or not. We're electronically filing it. So we do 1099s for our clients that need it. We don't want them doing it. So fellow tax professionals and small business owners, the other thing is you can file now directly with the IRS. So this is a neat option. However, you do have to have a transmittal control code. This is anything new. But you can go to the IRS website and in the information returns intake system, 
right up there on the IRS website with a transmittal control code. You can just go right there, which I think is pretty slick, and fill in the information related to those that are going to receive either a 1099 miscellaneous or a 1099 NEC. So for small business owners, if you're like, well, do I do paper? Where do I get the forms? What do I do with this? Boy, this is a phenomenal option for you, for those of you that still like to cut your own hair. Of course, I'm having fun with you, but that's part of JJ the CPA, right? I just call it like I see it. But with this, it's about 45 days, according to the website, for you to go through the process and actually get your transmitter control code. So right now, maybe you could get it in time, but the 1099 miscellaneous, 1099 NEC, they've got to get out to the recipients by the end of January. You've got to file the 1096 related to the 1099 by the end of January. So with that being said, if you're going to do it, you better act on it like literally today. Hopefully you'll get it in time. I don't know that I would count on it, but here's what's interesting. So with some of our clients, uh, Alona in my office, we've talked about, well, would it make sense uh, maybe for next year, for the clients that just have a handful of 1099s, would it make sense for them to go ahead and get a transmittal code? Maybe we're assisting them with that still, but by golly, it would be simple because it will produce the form that can also go to the recipient. Um, and this is kind of a trend we're going to see with the IRS is more things being able to file directly with the IRS. All right, let's talk about the nasty form 1099 NEC. This is a nasty form. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it's a nasty form because if you are completing a form 1099C NEC for you, your business, or for your client, and it has a social security number on it right there, that's where some nasty business can come into play to bite your client and maybe even you uh, here in the end, so to speak. But with this, the Form 1099-NEC standing for non-employee compensation came into play a couple of years ago, and it used to be box seven of the Form 1099 miscellaneous. You're like, JJ, I don't care about a history lesson. Great. All I'm telling you is when they broke it out from the 1099 miscellaneous and made it its own form, what it's done is put it in a different in its own category not only in who receives the 1099 NEC, which the rules don't seem all that different from when you report on 1099 miscellaneous, but it does change the due date of when you file the form 1096, which is January 31st. But here's the other, okay? It's going to be a bam right in your face if the IRS comes in and they start slapping on you and bam, boom, for those that you gave a social security, you gave a 1099 to on social security number. Now, for those that are bowing up, right? You're digging in your heels. You're going to get your Thor hammer out and you're like, no, I'm going to send 1099 NECs out to anybody I want. They got a social security number and I don't care. Yeah. That Thor hammer isn't going to stand up to the IRS. You bowing up and getting your heels dug in isn't going to stand up to the IRS. When you file a form 1099 NEC, Go ahead, and when you send it electronically in, there's going to be lights going on. It's kind of like, like, like the fire engine lights. You might as well just say you've got a light going on that if you have a Social Security number on it. And what that means is the IRS, and I think with AI, very simple. What's AI going to be able to do? Send out a letter without a human being involved in it. How could the IRS completely refund the Social Security bank, if you will? How could they make more money coming in than the IRS could ever spend and basically get us back to no debt, right? It would be uh, uh, sending letters out related to 1099 NEC to Social Security numbers, as well as, and it's not part of today's seminar, but it's part of my past seminars, sending out letters related to those that have a partnership that is non-passive, but they're not subjecting it to self-employment tax. Also looking at reasonable compensation with S corporations. This is all part of the movement with the IRS. And we gotta remember who's the IRS? Referees. They're not there out to get you, but with my clients, here's the deal. You're not going to be a client of mine. You are fired. Get out of here. If you are going to bring people on that really should be classified as an employee, okay? 
and you want to pay them as a 1099. Because with that, people will say, oh, well, I have 1099 employees. No, you don't. It doesn't exist. That's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as a 1099 employee. And the fact that you just call them a 1099 employee, you've already lost. You have already given in to the IRS by saying, oh, they're an employee. But when we're now looking at who should get a Form 1099 NEC, okay, what we're now looking at here, oh, I guess we're going to talk about the, the miscellaneous here first. But when we're talking about who gets the Form 1099 NEC, oh, let me go back here, slide. It's going to be anybody that you're paying more than $600 in the course of your trade or business. So if you're paying someone personally, you're not going to send out a 1099 NEC. This only be if you have a business. Now, no matter how you pay an attorney, you are going to send that attorney a Form 1099 NEC. I don't know why the attorney is getting picked on here, but they are, no matter what it is. Also, if you've withheld any tax related to backup withholding, then that gets reported on 1099 NEC. So there's massive and new and additional and increased penalties when you file a 1099 NEC and the IRS then determines later they were an employee. So with the uh, note here, the reason I don't want my clients uh, to pay anybody with a social security number on a 1099 NEC, other than maybe somebody that came one time and fixed their plumbing or something, is that my client's going to get nailed. My client is going to get nailed for Social Security and Medicare taxes that weren't collected, that weren't matched on. And really, it almost is, if uh, I did a video on this, if, if you had somebody that paid out a million dollars uh, in 1099s, okay, and you then go, well, what's their liability? Well, if they just treated those as employees instead of 1099, then the tax is 7.65%. You pay it in, you withhold it, you send it all in. By not doing that, and the IRS has a reclass, then you're going to pay the full amount of Social Security Medicare, not only what's withheld, but the match, which is 15.3%. So in this case that I consulted on, I said, you already have 150000 in liability. There's no way these people are not employees. Second, 100% penalty, boom, now you owe 300000 there's additional penalties, and it almost works to if you have on a million dollars, your exposure is getting nor north of a half a million dollars in addition to what it is that you paid out to the 1099. So I don't want my clients in those circumstances, right? So it's not about being a goody goody two shoe. What it's about is being sure that my clients are compliant so that they don't get in trouble later. When we're now talking about 1099 miscellaneous, so this one is not as popular anymore because most of the time 1099 miscellaneous was being filed in the past to report box seven, which was the old non-employee compensation. So most notably here, if you're paying rent of over $600, it's not to the owner, prizes, other income, box three, so it's kind of a catch-all, then you're going to file a form 1099 uh, miscellaneous. But most of our clients are not filing a 1099 miscellaneous. They're filing the 1099 NEC. Now, what are some exceptions here? Now, the first thing is, is that I don't spend a lot of time with my clients saying, oh, they need an exception. If somebody's close to the line and we're like, well, do we need to send them a 1099? Just send a 1099. That, this is my advice to my clients. Just send them one. Like, what, what are we doing here? Now, this also is an opportunity as a tax professional to go, well, I didn't know you were paying that person and therefore you probably shouldn't continue that. So it's a good opportunity for us to review who is it that we think our clients are sending 1099s to, even if they do it themselves. So we have clients that they prepare their own form 1099s, but what we're looking at is putting our client in a position though to go, well, let's make sure that if they're going there, that they went properly, number one. But number two, if they're not going to be proper, as in they should have been an employee, then we better get that fixed uh, going forward. So payments to corporations, including LLC, that are treated as a C-Corp or an S-Corp are not going to be uh, uh, a recipient of the 1099. You don't need to send them one unless they're an attorney. And then here's some other exceptions. I'm not going to run through it uh, uh, related to that. But Anything that you're paying to an employee goes on the W-2. So if you're doing any kind of reimbursements to employee, travel allowances, 
um, uh, you know, unless you don't have an accountable plan. And then if you don't, it needs to go on the W-2. So don't get me wrong. I mean, you definitely have to take a look at these things, but most people are probably tuning into my channel, my seminars, right? We're probably not dealing with a lot of these other things that come into play. The IRS has got some great uh, uh, resources for you at irs.gov going through the instructions. Uh, but the big thing to note here is that with the filing of 1099, NEC and miscellaneous, what our goal is with clients is to go, why are we filing these? And then if we are, and it's a social security number, I really do not see that you would want to continue that. So right now in the state of Oklahoma, if somebody works for, for you for one day and that's it, but they came in a capacity where you provided for them the tools, they came to your office or they worked on what you provided to them. And even if they do this for other people in Oklahoma, that's an employee after just one day. I don't see if the IRS sees it any different. The fact that somebody works from home means nothing. The fact that somebody can set their own schedule means nothing at all. What matters is, are they doing this for other people? What kind of control do you have over them? And this is the thing I, I, I've been telling my clients now for a long time, we're just not playing the game anymore. And if so, you're fired, get out of here. I don't have time for you. But it's this, we should not be sitting around trying to find ways that somebody's not an employee, because this is what I usually tell a client. If we're having a discussion about someone that you're paying, it's got to be somebody that you're paying regularly. And if you're paying them regularly, and we're now having a discussion, then they're probably a good candidate. Who's not a candidate? I'll give you an example. We have clients and somebody comes to clean their, uh, their offices. And a few of them, it's just an individual that comes to clean them. So they show up, they spend about an hour there. They come every week. They've been doing it for 25 years. They come every Thursday. They spend that hour and they clean. Okay, That is somebody that is not an employee. That is somebody that's coming independently. They're bringing their cleaning. They're emptying the trash. And they may be coming at a set time, which doesn't necessarily matter, as I said, indicated. But if you had somebody that they are now coming to your company once a week and they're doing services that include what you do as a business, right? So if this is a company that does computer work or if it's somebody that's a dentist and now someone's coming in and they're now helping you with what you're doing to make money, right? They're now cleaning teeth as a hygienist in a dentist's office, or they're helping you with some computer programming or doing some IT work on a regular basis. Then if they're helping you make money, meaning that's a part of the service you're providing, I also tell clients that's a really good indicator that most likely somebody is, if you're paying a social security number, needs to be treated as an employee. So let's talk about some year-end planning here. So one of the things uh, that we want to look at when I'm talking with clients is first just like anything changed here, right? So have you experienced any changes in terms of marital status? You have a new baby, anything significant? Did you make a new investment? Did you get an inheritance? Were there big losses? Did you get into a new business, but it didn't succeed, unfortunately, or looking at new success? You know, one of the things I really got to make sure I'm keeping an eye on with my clients is, hey, did you have any big capital gains? You know, check with your advisor. What about losses? And charitable contributions, those are things that can get at year end. But one of the reasons to ask in the beginning is, with charitable contributions, that has to be received by the charity on or before 1231 of, the, uh, of this year to get the deduction this year. And is the income going to be different in 24? So, you know, when I travel around talking to um, uh, different uh, CPA societies and whatnot, um, when we talk about year end and some of the things that we're going to be talking about here, some of the stuff may not make sense if 23's income is low, but we expect next year's income to be higher. The reason we would potentially want to do something about year end, first and foremost, is, well, I think this year's income is going to be higher than next year. So two things. One, my deductions could, could be more valuable this year, or my deductions this year could help uh, uh, reduce down the fact that my income is higher and then keep kind of a more stable tax liability, if you will. But many, for whatever reason, tax professionals, um, and I don't know if just the groups I'm talking to 
uh, decide that it's more important for them to make decisions for their clients without checking with them. But many, you know, especially as, as we get older, say, well, you know, it, I don't know if it makes any difference. You know, I mean, you're going to have to pay tax eventually. I mean, if you make money, you got to pay tax. And that's when I say, hey, listen, you got too many clients. You're working too hard. You need to raise your rates. You need to get rid of a few clients. You need to enjoy life and not look at tax planning as something that is um, just creating more havoc or more work for you and being cynical about year end planning. So we've got to know what is this year going to look like? Do we have any carryovers, not only of losses, deductions, but is there any tax uh, that was refunded in the prior year that is carried over into 2023? So we've got to ask questions in the beginning and in part having a discussion. Now, when we talk about the tax planning and we're walking things uh, through here, we want to look at would it make sense to defer income, right? And what are some ways we can defer income without breaking the law? You know, pretty easily. It, most small businesses are cash basis. Now, many small businesses that start out, they go, well, uh, you know, should I be cash or accrual? I'm like, you should be cash. And they're like, well, why wouldn't I want to be accrual? And I said, well, uh, here's here's one indicator for you. And it's I'm having a little fun with it, but when the IRS requires you to do something, typically that's your first indicator that it's not necessarily going to be in your favor, but maybe more in the government's favor. And if you get over a certain dollar amount, now 29 million in terms of gross receipts average of the prior three years, you're required to use accrual. So that's our first indicator. But what about what's the deal with accrual? Well, accrual is when I earn the income, so I just sell, I just sold a birdhouse. I just sold it. Here you go, customer. Here's your birdhouse. And they go, great, I'm going to get you paid in January. Well, if you're on accrual, you're going to pay tax on it at the time that you made the sale and it's complete. And even though you're owed the money and hadn't received it, you're going to pick it up as income. Now, for those that go, well, but the benefit of accrual is that whatever I owe come year end, regardless if I paid it out or not, I'm able to write it off. And I go, congratulations, you've done the matching method, meaning you're going to pick up, um, pick, up, pick up income regardless if you collect it or not, and you're going to expense expenses whether you paid for or not. And if we stop there, then we go, well, gosh, that just sounds like a really good thing. I don't have to spend the money and I get the write-off. But the issue with accrual and why it works more in the government's favor is you cannot do anything about your end in terms of deferring income or accelerating deductions. It is what it is. What did you sell? That's what you're going to pay tax on. What did you owe? That's what you get to deduct. You're not able to say, oh, well, I'm going to prepay uh, at December 31st, the rent for January. All that to say, cash basis is what all my clients work with. Now, for the tax professionals that say, oh, well, I have clients and accrual works for them. Awesome. I'm not saying that cash is uh, uh, the end all be all for all. I'm saying it's the end all be all for all my clients. I've never come across a situation where accrual works. So congratulations if you have a client that accrual works. That's awesome. But how do we defer income where it makes sense? And not all businesses can do it. So the first thing is, no, you don't get to just leave money in the cash till or put a check in your drawer and then go, oh, I didn't have it and I'm not going to report it until I deposit it into the bank. But if you have clients that owe you money, that you're getting ready to invoice, you can say, oh, well, maybe I just delay a little bit. Maybe I go ahead and just wait an extra bit of time before sending the invoice so that the money is collected the next year. Now, one of the things I tell the clients is, listen, don't be dumb about this. We can't ever do anything for tax purposes. So if that economically doesn't make sense, meaning by delaying your invoice, does that put you in a position where maybe something becomes uncollectible? or somebody skips town or whatever the case is, then don't do that. But for many businesses, if there's a predictive amount, by simply delaying the collection properly, by delaying the invoices, is it a way that you could defer income, so to speak? Now, when would we want to do that? It's like, well, my income, I think, is higher this year compared to next year. So I want to report it next year because it may actually be in a lower tax bracket. And there's plenty of my clients, and I don't understand and I doubt it's any of you that are on right now. 
I never understand tax professionals. And they say, well, you know, it's just all going to come out in the wash uh, anyways, number one. Number two, you know, I don't really see the benefit of all that. I mean, they're in the 35% bracket this year and they're in the 35% bracket next year. So with those tax professionals, they say, hey, uh, do me a favor. Why don't you pull out your debit card and put it on the desk uh, and or your check? You know, pull out your checkbook, would you? Now, you're getting ready to write the check that you're going to tell your client they need to write, right? Now, does it matter to you? Now, does it matter that you could do something that could reduce down what it is that your client is paying in April, even though you go, well, it's just deferring it? That's when I say you have too many clients. You're working with too many people that you've gotten cynical about year-end planning. Now, know this. This is being recorded for more people to watch. So probably those that are attending live, I'm preaching to the choir, as they say here in Oklahoma. Now, would you want to generate losses to match gains? Boy, I'm not a fan of this. I am not a fan of this. You got to do it meticulously and carefully. You got to do it with your financial advisor. I'm not a fan of it. But what we're talking about is, do you have a bunch of capital gains? And then do you have some losses? Would it make sense to offset them? Um, manage classification of income. Now, there's not much you can do about this, but manage by paying attention. What's ordinary income? What's capital? Can you go more in that direction? What's active? What's passive? The thing to know here is if you have passive income, then that right there could be subject to net investment income tax if your income's high enough. Passive income, though, is then all that's available if you have passive losses. So those are in a category of their own in some regards. Then you have active or otherwise known as non-passive. And if you have losses, are you able to take them? We got to make sure you have basis. So what we're looking at with clients is if we have losses, we've got to be very careful to ensure, number one, are they going to be allowed? So that takes into account of reviewing basis to make sure we're not at tax time and then going, oh my gosh, I didn't know that we didn't have basis here. They're not going to even be able to benefit from the loss and it's just going to then roll over. Now, I'm not going to be able to go through every single line item here, right? But looking at uh, the Section 199A, that's the Qualified Business Income Deduction, meaning taking that into account. So what's really interesting is that with some of our year-end planning, I'm telling clients, I'm like, hey, I don't know if um, you know we spend much more that we're going to really have the impact that we're thinking because you've now hit a level in your income and with your taxable income that as you spend more, it's reducing down your income, which is reducing down your qualified business income deduction. Now, for those that are, are under the assumption that that's the end all be all, you don't want to reduce down net income because you're reducing down your qualified business income deduction. It doesn't work out equal, uh, except for some very rare circumstances. So the qualified business income deduction is 20% of your net business income for starters is an extra deduction out of thin air. Also, just looking at with the planning, what's been withheld? What are my estimated tax payments? Because what we're focused on is what's the result come January 15th? Have you met your safe harbor? Do you need to pay anything? And can we avoid a surprise uh, when we're hitting April 15th? So looking at the IRAs, looking at RMD, which we're going to talk a little bit further about here, maximizing your contributions to retirement, the charitable contribution distribution, so this is a quick view. I've got a little more meat on the bone related to some of these things. But the big thing we're doing right now, and Cooper and I were talking and dealing with a client yesterday, is, okay, we know we can get a rough idea where you stand. But the biggest thing we're trying to figure out is, with where you're looking to be, what do you need to pay in January 15th? Does it need to be at least uh, the safe harbor? What's the safe harbor? Well, what was this year's tax? Or what's this year's tax to be? And then what's last year's tax? And you've got to pay in one of the other, right? So which one do you pay in? The lower of. Now, this is where the rules get a little uh, complicated, but your safe harbor, if you're looking at last year's tax and your uh, AGI is over 150,000, then it's last year's tax, total net tax times 110%. That's your safe harbor based on the prior year. Then for this year, there's a lot of different ways you can look at it, but it's what is your estimated tax for this year times 90%, and then you pick, and you only are required to pay in the lower of. 
Now, we actually never go with the 90%. You can look at those rules, but I go with, what do we think the tax is going to be this year? That's the number I'm going with versus what's last year's tax plus 10% if they're over the AGI. And then I go, okay, because that 10% of margin, I'm like, I'd rather just be a true margin of error versus relying on that margin of error to then figure out, okay, what have they paid in year to date? What has been withheld? Now, fellow tax pros, you're probably doing this as well, but we get the pay stub from uh, the payroll company to ensure that whatever was withheld last year is in fact what's being withheld this year. And that way uh, we're making sure that nothing is gonna surprise us uh, and in part, because we don't want there to be any penalties or interest. So here's just some, uh, some takeaways. Right. So when we're talking about tax planning in the final days, it's like, well, what do we have time for? What can we do? Really, what could we act on? So I've never had a client that's done this. And you would have to contact probably your mortgage company to do this because most have their mortgage payment uh, just paid routinely. But it's just something to be aware of. So the first thing to note is that when we're talking about itemizing your deductions on your individual tax return. When you now go, well, what is that? Well, in a nutshell, it's medical expenses that exceed 7.5% of your income. It's state and local taxes, otherwise known as SALT, but only to the tune of 10 grand. And it's your mortgage interest to some limitations and your charitable, okay, to the limitation of AGI. I'm not going to get into all those details and get down in the weeds, but that's your main things that are your itemized deductions. Now, 90% of Americans no longer itemize their deductions because a standard deduction is so high now and even went up into 24. But if you have a client or you that you're like, well, I'm kind of close to the standard deduction. Do I want to do some things at year end that get me into an amount that's going to be higher than the standard deduction? Now, the key is when I talk to clients is, you know, here's your standard deduction. So if you're above it by $10, and we itemize your deductions, we only got 10 more dollars. We don't get standard deduction plus itemized. But the one thing that makes a difference in Oklahoma, for starters, is that if you do itemize your deductions at the federal level, then you're able to itemize your deductions at the state level. Now, there is a cap to that, um, but you end up with a little bit larger deduction. So there are many that say, well, you need to do the analysis. Great, do the analysis. But one of the things you're looking at is, well, do I need more itemized deductions to make this worth it? So if you have a payment coming due at the 1st of 2024 in January, so I have a mortgage payment and it's due and paid January uh, 1st of each year or the first business day. Well, technically I could go ahead and log in and go ahead and pay that. And if I paid it before year end, any interest that has accrued to that date that I made a payment, would then be an extra deduction going on my tax return uh, in my itemized deductions. Now, you do that and you do it once, well, then next year you're only going to have 11 payments. So state and local taxes limited to 10 grand, uh, charitable gifts and donations. So some of this is with clients who are like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like my income's a little higher this year. I'm an individual taxpayer. I mean, I don't have a small business. There's not much I can do. What else is there? So if somebody's regularly making charitable contributions, you go, well, maybe go ahead and in, in uh, December, maybe would it make a difference if you paid in in December, your January, maybe even your February charitable contributions. So charitable contributions being a part of itemized deductions, if it could make a difference, you go, well, maybe if you bunched it up as well as some other things, you might get that extra deduction. Now, I'm going to just tell you right now, it's been rare that it actually has been a circumstance where when we've looked at this, that it ended up really being some big impact. Typically, it's a big impact when somebody's doing kind of a larger out of the, you know, kind of out of the blue uh, tax deduction. Also on medical, there's more that can qualify for medical expenses. And it does have to get over that hurdle of seven and a half percent. But I was talking with a client the other day, they're expecting some losses in their business because of some things that have happened here in the last few months. And they were then asking, um, which I discuss here later, you know, hey, do you think it would be a good time to do a Roth conversion? And so we talked through that. But I said, hey, by the way, 
uh, you're going to have a very low threshold for your AGI. I mean, you still have other income and wages and stuff, but you're going to have a lot lower threshold. And so with any medical expenses, that seven and a half percent of your adjusted gross income, well, if adjusted gross income is lower, then that threshold is lower, of course. So do you have a lot of medical out of pocket? Of course, the answer was no, but that would be a circumstance to kind of pay attention to that. Electric vehicles, we know that we have the credit uh, $7,500 for new and up to $4,000 for used. Now, if that vehicle uh, MSRP for those that are 6,000 pounds or less GVWR, the MSRP can exceed $55,000 for those that are over 6,000 pounds GVWR, vans, SUVs, pickup trucks, then the, the MSRP can't be uh, uh, over $80,000. Now, if you make too much, you won't qualify for the credit, which I've indicated here uh, for both the, the new and the used. Now, one thing to note is that in 2024, the IRS came out that these tax credits, you can go to the dealership if the dealership is registered with the IRS, and you can immediately experience the tax credit. You don't have to wait until you file your tax return, which means that if it qualifies for 7,500, it would be immediately 7,500 off that purchase price. And when you go to the IRS, go to, I think it's federalenergy.gov um, or the IRS website, you'll be able to find that make and model and know that it qualifies. For used vehicles, you can put in the VIN and energy, uh, gosh, what is it? Uh, uh, gosh, energy, it's on my website. How about that? So when we get to next year, two things to note on that. You still have to rectify that tax credit on your tax return for tax year 2024 when you're filing for it in 2025. What's interesting here is that if somebody doesn't have enough tax liability, whether it's this year or next year when you're comparing the two, is a big difference. And what does that mean? Let's say that somebody qualifies for a $7,500 credit this year. They're going to file their tax return, but their total tax is only $6,000. They have a $7,500 tax credit, so it's going to zero out their tax. So the $6,000 in tax, okay, and I'm not talking about refund or, or the O. I'm talking about the line item on Form 1040. Here's their total tax. It's six grand. They have a credit of $7,500. Awesome. It's going to zero that out. But now there's $1,500 of that tax credit that didn't get used. What happens to it? It's just lost. It doesn't carry over. Why am I pointing this out to you? Well, in 2024 you get that exact scenario and you're filing it on your return, it's going to be the same. However, if you're going to the dealership and you walk in and you go, hey, I want to do that $7,500 credit. This vehicle qualifies. They go, great. You get it. The IRS is going to send money to the dealership. You walk out paying $7,500 less, borrowing $7,500 less. When you go to file your tax return, if you don't have enough tax, you don't have to pay it back. But if you don't go to the dealership and you're now just filing for that credit on the tax return, it works just the same as 23, meaning it's not going to yield any benefit above and beyond what your actual tax is. Now, here's the other thing. For 24, even if you get the credit in advance, if your income is over these thresholds that I have listed here in 24, then when you're filing a 24 tax return, that would be in 25, you're going to pay that credit back. So somebody gets a $7,500 credit. They go in, dealership goes great. You qualify, knock down $7,500. And now you're going to file a return. Your income is over these thresholds. Then you're going to pay that $7,500 back. So also when we're looking at charitable contributions, what we've got to look at here too is that I think I indicated it earlier, when you're giving to the charity, it has to be complete by the end of the year. Now, if you have some stocks or bonds or any kind of investments and you go, well, you know, do I give them 10 grand or would I give them 10 grand worth of stocks or mutual funds? Because it's kind of six and one half, right? You're getting 10,000. But if you have mutual funds or you have stocks and they've appreciated, well, when you give that stock, you get to deduct it at the fair market value. So I've even had clients that are like, well, even though this is worth more than 10 grand, I bought into this. My cost basis is 10 grand. I normally would give 10 grand. So I'm going to give my cost basis of 10 grand. But that fair market value of that stock right now is four times that. 
So I'm giving up 10,000 of what I put in, but right now fair market value is 40,000, which means they get to deduct 40,000. They didn't have to sell the stock to get the money to then donate it. So long story short, that does have to be complete before year end. That has to be transferred in ownership. So if somebody's doing that, they got to get on it right now. If somebody's mailing a check to a charity, the charity will not include it in the letter of receipt indicating and backing up that deduction if they don't get it before year end. Annual gift tax exclusion. You get no deduction for it. Well, I helped out my mom. Great. That's awesome for you. Do I get a deduction for it? No. Well, but I had to help them with this and I had to help them with that. That's, again, that's wonderful of you. It's no deduction. Here's the deal. Then you say, well, do they have to pay tax on it? No, the recipient would not need to pay tax on it. So what is this gift tax exclusion for anyways? Well, what it comes down to is you can give up to 17000 to somebody. Now, they're not going to pay tax on it. But if it's above that, then it's potentially subject to gift taxes. And to not make it subject to gift tax, you would need to file a gift tax return to say that the amount above the 17 grand to this person is going to be applied against my lifetime exclusion. So with this, here's what I just tell clients. There's only a downside to this from the standpoint of there could be gift tax. You're getting no benefit for it to be paid. Now, there's not a way for a business to gift anything to anyone. So a business that's paying it out is always going to be some kind of compensation. Uh, also, helping kiddos with college. Now, one thing I want you to note is, starting a couple of years ago, the IRS is not going to allow you in 23 to pay for 24 uh, uh, college tuition and get to use it as your 23 expenses. Um, and now on the Form 1098-T, it actually will indicate that that were there any dollars that were collected by the institution in 23 that were related to 24. So used to be before they defined it, um, there was nothing that prevented it, it was unknown. So with this, if you owe to the college, then it would make sense to potentially look at, well, do we need to get them paid up for the semester in which our kid had attended? Also looking at contributing to a 529 plan, you don't get a federal tax deduction, but you might be in a state where you are getting a deduction uh, down at the uh, at, at the state level. Now, in our state, we do have until uh, uh, April 15th to put money in a 529 plan and get the state deduction for the prior year. Now, of course, you want to max out your 401k, your simple plan, making sure uh, that if you're planning to, that you are. Also, making that charitable donation uh, uh, from your IRA. So if somebody has an RMD, which means a required minimum distribution, now under current law, if you're 73 or older, that means that whatever you've got sitting in an IRA, then you are going to be required to pull money out. Soon it won't be related to the Roth, but nonetheless, you got it sitting there, you got to pull it out. It's called required minimum distributions based on your life expectancy and the balances as of the end of the year, et cetera. The financial institutions figure that out. But for somebody that goes, well, I don't know that I need the RMD, which would be a really wonderful position to be in, uh, what they can do is basically gift that amount. So they don't have to then pull the RMD into their income, pay tax on it, and then give it to the charity. They can simply give it straight to the charity. Interesting enough, you can receive a check and then the check has to be payable to the charity but the owner of the IRA can get a check from the charity that's payable to the charity and physically give it to the charity uh, because some would like to do that extra step. So also looking at, is it the right time to either put money into an IRA, a Roth IRA? We have some limits related to that. We know that with Roths, Roth IRA, uh, don't have required minimum distributions related to that, which is fairly new. And also, is it time to look at converting? Now, when we're talking about converting, we're saying, well, whatever's in the traditional IRA, you're converting it to a Roth IRA, then that's going to lead to a taxable situation. Many think incorrectly that it's dollar for dollar of what you put into a traditional IRA, that if you put that money in at year end into a traditional IRA, you can immediately roll it to a Roth IRA dollar for dollar and there's no tax. That would only be the case if you had no other money in any other IRA. So the thing to remember is 
at year end, if you're looking at doing a Roth conversion, you have to take all the monies, no matter where they are, all the IRAs. You saying, well, I have an IRA at this brokerage company and I have an IRA at that brokerage company. To the IRS, doesn't matter. You're going to add all that up. What portion of your IRA is from pre-tax monies? It's that percentage that when you convert it is going to be subject to tax. Also taking a look, you know, talking with your tax advisor, as I indicated earlier, I got the client, they're having some low year. Um, well, is there anything that might make sense to sell at a long-term capital gain? And you would then have 0% because if your income's under a certain threshold, which is listed here, your capital gain tax rate is zero. Why would you do that? Well, you would be able to buy it. I'm sorry, you'd be able to sell it, pay no tax on it, and you can rebuy your position. The only time that you can't buy a re, uh, rebuy your position uh, is if there's a loss and then it would be a wash sale. Also taking a look at year end, hey, what are my withholdings? What should they be next year? Would it make sense to have withholdings from Social Security? Coop and I were talking about that related to a client that seems to owe. Well, Social Security can withhold it. You got to do a form W-4V, also looking at any kind of distributions from retirement, getting that where there's taxes uh, uh, being withheld. Also looking at if you have a business and you're purchasing assets, if you get that done before year end, so you purchase it, you have it in hand, you place it in service, this year of that cost, assuming 100% business use, you can deduct up to 80% of that. That's whether it's new or used. Now, next year, that bonus depreciation, if you will, uh, is going to be 60%. And then also just making sure that if you're planning to take advantage of the uh, qualified business income deduction, which is that 20% of business income, if you're planning to take advantage of it, well, make sure you're going to still qualify. You know, those that file Schedule C on the net income, that's qualified business income. It's rare, super rare, but there are times that net income on Schedule E, super rare for that to happen, can also qualify for qualified business income. But most of the time where you see Qualified business income that's going to be eligible for that 20% deduction is going to be from an S-corp or a partnership. So with this, ensuring that it's going to be allowed based on the overall income. So Amanda, I think we're sitting pretty good because we're right at about an hour. We have wrapped up our seminar. Uh, we want to thank ADP uh, for sponsoring today. Don't forget that our next free seminar is at the end of January. You can sign up for it. You will be getting a link to re-watch this seminar. So watch your email. You'll get a link where you can come and re-watch this or those that didn't attend. Uh, that's one of the benefits for signing up for the seminar. A lot of people know that. Like, well, I can't attend it live, but I'll go ahead and sign up for it because when the seminar's over, you get an email about 48 hours later that will then give you a link to re-watch it and you'll also be able to get the materials. So I wanna thank ADP for a wonderful year. Um, looking forward to a lot of great things in 2024. Um, I don't have a slide up on here, so for the few that are still hanging out, uh, I do wanna let you know that uh, when we look at 2024, and I don't know why I didn't, uh, I don't know why I didn't put a slide in on this, but I've got group 300, it's similar to group 51, but it's 55 hours of CPE. It's a once a month private Zoom seminar. It also includes twice a month an informal Q&A where we just get on Zoom and who shows up where we just start chatting about what's going on, what questions do you have, making myself available twice a month in an informal way. So if you go to jjthecpa.com, you'll be able to look and find Group 300 to see about signing up for that. But for those that popped off, unfortunately, you're not going to hear this part. But I am teaming up with groups that we're going to be able to get some special benefits as a part of Group 300. Uh, I'm not going to mention who the groups are, but they're national groups. And what do I mean by that? Well, I got to go buy it? Not necessarily. We've got a group right now that they're, they're, they're looking to offer Group 300 some free access, or at least for a period of time, and giving some feedback to me on how they like it, how it's working. And there's going to be a new direction going, I think, with uh, tax professionals and small business owners in kind of embracing technology. And uh, these are things related to that. Um, so with this, some other benefits that come out of that. And so with this, we are out of here, Amanda. 
Thank you all so much. I hope you have a great rest of 2023. Look forward to seeing you in 2024. Happy holidays. I appreciate you. I love you. If you haven't come to a seminar before, by golly, I hope to see you at another one. And with that, here we go. All right. Hey, thanks for tuning in. And those that are re-watching this, I hope that you subscribe. And then don't you ever forget, you've never met a CPA quite like me. Talk to y'all soon. We're out of here.